Hello, welcome to all of you for coming. Thank you so much for coming out to um, honor the memory of Judy Shinogel, uh, who I've enjoyed learning about in the last couple of years. She clearly meant so much to so many people, and we'll hear more in a little bit. I'm Susan Sterrett. I'm the director of the School of Public Policy, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this talk honoring Judy Shinogel, who is an expert in health policy as a result of the generosity of her family, we uh, award and um, we honor a student in health policy every year who is a PhD candidate in public policy. Today we're honoring Erin Dorian, who will speak to us about the extremely important issue of the Affordable Care Act and uh, contraceptive coverage in unintended pregnancies. So I, without any further ado, I want to make sure that we have plenty of time uh, to honor the Chernobyl family uh, for their generosity in supporting this award and to learn more about Erin and her talks. Or Erin, excuse me, Erin Dorian. I was collapsing here first and last. So Erin Dorian and her talk. I also want to thank my colleagues um, uh, Miriam Ralston and Pam Doppler who organized this event. We have some lovely snacks in the back. Please be sure to help yourself. So thank you and welcome. Great. Um, so I'm um, Nancy Miller, public policy um, as well. And I'd also like to welcome you to the seventh annual um, Judith A. Shinogel Award Lecture and to express my appreciation and our appreciation um, to the family of Judy for establishing the fellowship in her memory. Um, Dr. Mary L. Cohn, who's a sister of um, Dr. Judy Shinogel, was not able to join us this year and would like me to share a few memories with you. Um, Dr. Cohen is an associate professor and area head of mu um, music education at the University of Iowa. Dr. Cohen has led the Oakdale Prison Community Choir since 2009. At a prior lecture, uh, Mary, Mary Cohen, played a recording of a song that she wrote in memory of Judy, Find the Joy, performed by the Prison Choir. We'll provide a link to this recording when we make available this afternoon's lecture. Mary shares that Judy was such a positive role model for many people. For her younger sister, Mary, um, Mary, Judy influenced her to start piano lessons, teach group fitness, and to, um, to uh, earn her PhD, leading to the um, position that she has now as an associate professor. And Mary sends her congratulations to Erin Dorian. Jim McCarthy, um, Judy's partner and family representative, is here to share more reflections on Dr. Schnobel. Jim works with Hannibal Software, which is a computer company um, that supports political campaigns. Mary shares that Jim and Judy met at the Hawk and Duck, um, not Hawk and Dove, excuse me, one of Washington, D.C.'s uh, oldest establishments. So please join me in welcoming Jim to the podium. Thank you, Nancy. Yes, I think it's uh, kind of important to share a little bit about Judy, um, particularly since, as I say, a lot of her associates and all have retired from the School of Public Policy in my part. Don and Linda and David and all have. Uh, so this is an opportunity, I think, to kind of talk a little bit about Judy. And um, uh, since Mary couldn't make it, it became my task to be able to do that. Um, one note I'd like to say is, if you don't know, Judy was um, killed in a car accident on the BW Parkway. Um, a Comcast service guy was going to work in the morning, fell asleep at the wheel, and crossed over. And that's how, um, that's how she died. Um, this is a thing in case any of you ever become the condition, uh, places of prominence. The BW Parkway is not under the Highway Safety Act because it's controlled by the National Park Service. So because of that, they don't have to meet the same safety laws as 95, 395, those type of ones. So there's not a continuous barrier in the middle 
between the two highways. And because of that, that's how she lost her life. One side note, though, was um, Judy was traveling with her two dogs. Rooney died, but Ziggy was on the passenger side and lived. But I would like, that day, um, after dealing with the police and everything, um, they told me that Zig was uh, being kept in the Greenbelt dog pound, but had been injured in the accident. So, not knowing what to do, I called her best friend, Stephanie, and said, Zig's, the only thing that I can do today that's positive is Zig is in the dog pound, and we have to get him out and get him to a doctor. So, she said, I'll meet you there, drop everything, I'll meet you there. Uh, Stephanie and her husband and kids live like on the Appalachian Trail. I'll tell you how far they are from this area. But they got in their car, came down, got Zig, and uh, I was able to take him to a veterinarian. And Zig is 14 and a half years old now, and uh, is the oldest one alive in that particular litter, to tell you what's going on. So about nice things that sometimes happen during tragedies, I have to thank Stephanie and her family for that. Um, as I met Judy when she came to D.C. during the um, Michigan State Georgia Tech basketball game for March Madness in 1990, which went into like double overtime, and I think Georgia Tech won, Michigan State won that game. Um, that's where I met Judy, who had just come to work the American Pharmaceutical Association. She graduated from Kansas with a degree in pharmacy because she decided when she was a junior she didn't like engineering. Um, she only got one B when she was at Kansas and it was in golf. <laughs> um, so when she was at the APHA she was doing association work and she decided after being there for like a year, year and a half while the association working people was good, but as far as actually getting to affect policy or make changes in policy or get suggestions in policy, um, it wasn't happening. She couldn't affect any change. All she was doing was carrying out other people's programs, policies that had been put in place. And after doing some thought about it, we came to the solution that you either had to have a doctorate or at least a master's in about 10 or 15 years of experience in DC to be a person that actually can affect policy. So because of that, she didn't want to wait 10 or 15 years and have a master's, so the faster way to do it was to try. So what it is is she actually took a healthcare course at night, and it was at UMBC. She took one course here. and. Um, she liked it, so we decided that um, if she got into either Penn or Harvard, that she should quit school, quit her job, go, and go for it. So um, that's what she did, and she got into Harvard, and next thing you do, we moved her to Cambridge. So she did that. Um, in the summers, she used to work, she got a job working for the Congressional Budget Office, uh, and their health economic stuff, costing pharmaceutical plans or changes. So she was, the, I think, the longest time part-time employee that CBO ever had. So she worked on that and did that all the way until she um, actually went and took her first job at the University of South Carolina. So she did that for a number of years. Even when she worked for Dr. Saulkiever up in Hopkins, she still had this part-time job in DC. So. Um, she really liked that, and um, Harvard was very good. After Harvard, she went to Hopkins. That's where she met David Saul Kiever. And uh, Pinka and Marissa were also there as doctoral students who were on the committee with, uh, here to make determinations as far as who gets the Chernobyl Award. And um, um, after that, um, she took a position at the University of South Carolina, um, and the reason they did, she took that there is she knew the people down there, but they would take her before she actually graduated. She had completed her dissertation and everything, but 
The reason that we, which leads me to the reason why we do this particular award. Um, going to school when you're for your doctoral dissertation, it's a long time. And it's hard to make enough money to make ends meet while you're doing this. And what happened with Judy was her loans from Harvard were coming due right at the time that she was graduating from uh, um, Hopkins. So South Carolina said they would take her right away. And so off she went. And uh, stayed there for a couple of years until South Carolina decided they were going to push all their schools together under one dean. And everybody in the pharmaceutical, her school, except for one professor, retired. Because they were not thrilled with the idea of having everything pushed together. Because uh, South Carolina used to have multiple schools in very multiple locations. It's kind of like here, if they took UMBC, University of Maryland, and any other university affiliate school, and pushed them all together, and you just had one dean that was over like the whole thing. And so, that's when she decided it was time to leave, and she came back to D.C. She uh, worked for a consulting firm, and that's when she decided she never wanted to work for a consulting firm <laughs> ever again. <laughs> she really liked academia. Um, I have this thing at home, which is this um, chart that she made up, what she liked and disliked, the various things. Whenever she had decisions to make, she would do one of those type of things. And there was like nothing on the consulting side at all. <laughs> it was, so she really did like that. Um, she uh, left there and went to the University of Maryland. And she was also a fellow at um, NCHS, which is the Healthcare Statistics, National Healthcare Statistics, which is out in Hyattsville, Maryland. And she was a fellow there while she was also at uh, Maryland. Um, for a number of different reasons, there was no collegiality at the time in Maryland among the professors and all that type of stuff. Everybody kind of just came, did their thing, and left. And that's not a criticism. It's probably all changed since then as far as that type of thing goes. But the reason that it didn't work out was the first day when she's moving her stuff into uh, her office, there was a parking space right in front of the door so she's gonna, she backs her car up and starts unloading stuff so she can take it in. And this guy in his car pulls up and starts beeping at her and starts yelling at her that that's his parking space. And that was Gary Williams, who was the basketball coach <laughs> at the University of Maryland. <laughs> so that was probably not the best of signs at the time for that type of thing. So at that time, Judy wasn't sure what to do. Dr. Saul Kiever was here and decided, well, she would take a uh, chance and come here. And once she came here, everything clicked. She loved it here from the first day, as far as working with the people that were here. Um, she did research stuff with a number of different people. She worked with Don on um, gambling and casino stuff for the state of Maryland. She worked with Dr. Salkeever. And then she also got her own uh, grants that she was and got some of the, um, considering how many years that she had actually been applying for grants, she did very well. And i um, very proud of her about those type of things, just with her largest grants, some of them happened right when she died. So it was a terrible time as far as um, doing those type of things. But uh, for myself, I've been to all these except for one, and I think that the idea of this whole thing is just a wonderful idea. And the reason is trying to support people as they're going from their masters to make it down the final end of the list to get your doctorate. And uh, I think we've gotten, I need to check me, I think <coughs> two so far have made it Actually, since we... Three now. That's three? All right. So we're batting pretty good, <laughs> considering there's only seven. I know Steve was the first, but um, we've been doing pretty well, and I think that supporting people through this whole time so they can actually make it and get over the line as far as getting your dissertation done and through is such a big thing, and anybody that makes it through this thing should be congratulated for the fortitude 
and concentration it takes to make it all the way through to the end of these things is just amazing. So because of that, I'd like to congratulate you on starting this process. We hope you're hugely successful and read about you and all sorts of things. And um, my sincerest congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jim, for sharing a little about um, Judy with us. And now I'd like to share um, a quite recent um, memory of Judy from one of our graduates. Um, so earlier this week, I was um, presenting research at the American Public Health Association. And I spent some time with Keith Elder, who is a 2002 graduate of our doctoral program. And Keith's first faculty position after graduation was with the University of South Carolina and um, in the School of Public Health there, where Judy was a faculty member at the time. And Keith remembers um, how helpful Judy was during his three-day interview, including one day of meetings that ran from 8 a.m. in the morning until midnight. And I think that Keith, still remembering Judy and Judy's assistance to him while he was there, um, speaks to the person that she was. So it's now my pleasure to introduce um, Ms. Erin Dorian, who's this year's recipient of the Judith A. Shinogo Award. Ms. Dorian is a doctoral candidate in the School of Public Policy, where she's focused on health policy. Ms. Dorian is the director for the policy at, um, director for policy at the Maryland Hospital Association. In this position, Erin is instrumental in the development of the Maryland Hospital Association's workforce and capacity um, strategies. Most recently, she led the association's efforts to quantify discharge delays for be behavioral health patients from acute care hospitals in the community. Previous positions include Chief of Government and Public Affairs for the Maryland Health Care Commission, and lead staff to the Maryland, um, State of Maryland's House Appropriations Committee through her position with the Department of Legislative Affairs. Ms. Dorian received a Master in Public Policy from the Rockefeller College of Public Affairs and Policy at the um, University of Albany and a um, Bachelor of Arts from the University of Maryland. It's been my privilege to work with Ms. Dorian as her advisor and instructor and now as the chair of her dissertation committee. I'd like to note that the external reviewers who selected Ms. Dorian um, for the Judith A. Chernobyl Award found her to be a particularly strong candidate um, in part due to her public sector um, work, um, which reflects a little of um, Judy's um, career tra trajectory as well, uh, and this experience combined with her strong research skills. Ms. Dorian will be presenting her dissertation research which relates to the 2010 Affordable Care Act's contraceptive coverage requirements and their impact on the rate of unintended pregnancies. So please join me in uh, welcoming Ms. Dorian to the podium. Thank you, Nancy. And I'm going to try to make this technology work, but I make no promises. Um, so good afternoon. My name is Erin Dorian, and today I will be talking to you with, with you about my dissertation research on the impact of the Affordable Care Act contraceptive coverage mandate um, on the unintended pregnancy rate. I recently defended my dissertation proposal to my um, committee and am finally a PhD candidate, which I'm very excited about, as you can see from my three exclamation points. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about, my, uh, about myself and my um, topic, but um, I want to thank a few people before I start. So I want to start by thanking um, Dr. Shinogle's family, including Jim, for that wonderful introduction um, of Dr. Shinogle and her work. I'm truly honored to be this year's recipient, and the more I learn and hear about Dr. Shinogle, the more I understand that we have a lot in common. Um, starting from our interest in research and how that research can be applied to policy um, and our love of dogs. So um, I can tell you, and from looking at um, the placard in the back with pictures of Dr. Shinogel, um, her dogs won agility competitions. My dog probably would not win an agility competition. 
Um, but maybe she could have given me some tips on how to uh, make sure that my dog can walk upstairs without falling down. Um, you know, unfortunately, I did not cross paths with Dr. Shinogel uh, during my time here taking classes at UMBC, but I really did want to get to know her even before this event, and so I spoke to um, a number of students uh, that, that knew her better and some colleagues at work that worked with her through um, the state of Maryland. So luckily, Maryland is a pretty small place, and I was able to find a number of people that talked about her. What I heard over and over was that Dr. Shinogel ca cared deeply about her students and their work and her own work. She tried hard to get to know every student in her classes and what they were hoping to gain from the courses she was teaching. She was always available to help. One of the students that I know told me that while she was informal as a professor and encouraged lots of open dialogue, she was tough and had high standards. I hope somebody describes me like that one day. Another former student of Dr. Shinogel's said that she really understood not just the study of public policy, but she understood policy makers and the policy making in the real world. From these conversations, it's clear to me that she really left a lasting legacy on UMBC and beyond. So again, thank you to Dr. Shinogel's family, not just for this award, but for giving me the opportunity to learn a little bit more about her and her life. I'd also like to thank my dissertation committee, especially Dr. Miller, who has guided me to this point. And it's required a lot of guidance. <laughs> thank you to the public policy department, especially Miriam for setting up this event today. I'd like to thank my colleagues from MHA and MHCC who are here today, who, even when my work slips because I'm stressed about work, they, about school, they always keep it to themselves. <laughs> and lastly, I'd like to thank my friends and family in the audience. Though I do my fair share of public speaking professionally, I've never had this many people who know me intimately watching. While you're speaking to a group you don't know, you can take some solace in the fact that they will probably forget what you discussed, your name, and really anything about you right after the presentation is over. This is not really an option for me today, so I've come up with a pretty good solution. If this goes completely sideways, I'm changing my name, running away, and joining witness protection. But don't worry, Dr. Miller. I'll wait until after my final defense. Um, so for those of you who don't know me here, I want to talk a little bit. I thought I'd take a minute to introduce myself, although Dr. Miller did a really good job. And I want to talk about how I got to this point. And I've taken the long way around. Um, I graduated from the University of Maryland College Park in 2004 with a degree in government and politics. While many of my classmates were choosing to go to law school, I decided I wanted a career in public service. And for this, a master's in public policy was the next logical step. I attended the Rockefeller College of Public Affairs at SUNY Albany and had the opportunity to work for a U.S. Senator. Working in a district office gave me a better perspective of what a senator does directly for his or her constituents, also known as constituent services. This experience reinforced the idea that all politics is local. I fielded my fair share of pothole complaints in those years. <laughs> it was also during this time that I reconnected with an old friend from high school who later became my husband. After graduate school, and with a then fiance who was willing to move to Maryland having never visited the state, I took a job with the Department of Legislative Services as a budget analyst and then a committee staffer for the House of Delegates Appropriations Committee. It was there that I began to realize and understa that understanding poli policy makers is as important as understanding policy. You can have all the good information and facts in the world, but oftentimes none of that matters if you, could not, if you cannot communicate it well, and sometimes it doesn't matter even if you can. I'm sure that Dr. Shinogel and I could have shared many stories, and I could have learned a lot from her experience with not just in association work, as I learned today she's doing, but with state policymakers. Most recently, I've worked at the Maryland Healthcare Commission, an independent state regulatory commission, and the Maryland Hospital Association. At this point, if you aren't, if you aren't thinking, man, I wish she would hurry up, she's between me and the, and the snacks, you might be thinking, great, Erin, what does this have to do with insurance coverage for contraception? And the answer is absolutely nothing. Though I've always had, re had a research interest in women's health and wrote my master's essays on insurance coverage for IVF, I've never worked professionally in the women's health world. What I do care very deeply about is applying evidence to the policy-making process. 
especially where politics get involved. And where are the politics more fraught than when we're talking about sexual activity, reproduction, contraception, and women's health? It was these interests that brought, that brought me to my topic, understanding the impact of the Affordable Care Act on women's contraceptive choices and unintended pregnancy. So I want to spend a brief moment talking about the history and popularity of contraception. The first oral contraceptive, also known as the pill, was approved by the Food and Drug Administration in 1960. Since then, options for safe, reliable, and reversible contraception, uh, contraceptives like the IUD, the ring, and the patch have made it easier for women to choose a method that would work best for their particular life circumstances. Contraception is also very popular. 99, nearly 99% of women who have ever had sex with a man will use some form of contraception in their lifetime. Even with these advances, nearly 50% of all pregnancies are characterized as unintended. An unintended pregnancy is defined as a pregnancy that is either unwanted or mistimed based on a woman's self-reported intention of becoming pregnant at the time of, con of conception. These unintended pregnancies have adverse outcomes for the child and the mother. Adverse health, health outcomes for the child can include low birth weight and birth, deficits, birth defects, and for the mother, delayed onset of prenatal care and maternal depression, just to name a few. And these consequences extend throughout the lifetime of the child. Unintended pregnancy can have costs beyond the individual child or mother as well. Estimates of the total cost of unintended or mistimed pregnancy to the U.S. taxpayer range from $9.6 to $12.6 billion a year. This includes the medical costs associated with, with a pregnancy and the ongoing medical expenses of, of the child in the first year of life. An estimate of the direct medical cost of unintended pregnancy is approximately $4.6 billion per year. We also know that 95% of unintended pregnancies occur among women who do not regularly use contraception. So we have a way to make sure that pregnancies can be well-timed and well-planned. Providing access to reliable birth control is a key strategy for reducing unintended pregnancy. Every 10 years, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, along with a group of subject matter experts, develops a new set of science-based goals and objectives aimed at improving the health of all Americans. The Healthy People 2020 initiative included the goal, included the goal of preventing unintended pregnancy. Objectives included in this goal were increasing the use of contraceptives. Still, women reported barriers to accessing the most commonly used prescription method, or the pill. These include a lack of health insurance coverage, not having a regular doctor or clinic to visit, and difficulty accessing the pharmacy or the requirement for a pap smear before a pharmaceutical refill. In addition to Healthy People 2020, there are other policy interventions that have led to increasing access and utilization of contraception. The 1967 Civil Rights Act prohibits employers from discriminating against an employee on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. The 1978 Pregnancy Discrimination Act, which amended Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, prohibits sex discrimination on the basis of pregnancy. This is all, this is all relevant because jumping ahead to, to 2000, the, equal, the Employment Equal Opportunity Commission, or EEOC, ruled that employers that covered prescription drugs and, you, and prevention services for other conditions but did not cover contraception were in violation of the 1978 Pregnancy Discrimination Act. According to the Kaiser Family Foundation, in, t in 2017, nearly 60% of women ages 19 to 64 across the U.S. were covered by employer-sponsored health insurance. So this decision by the EEOC really um, increased access for contraception for those, for those women who were covered by employer-sponsored insurance. Furthermore, beginning in the 1990s, states began to regulate the provision, the provision of contraceptive coverage and other family planning services through the state health insurance markets. Currently, 30 states and D.C. require state-regulated health insurance plans to cover contraception. However, a state's regulatory authority only extends to the state-regulated markets and does not include self-funded plans regulated by the federal government under ERISA. Nearly 60% of covered workers are insured through these self-funded plans. The Affordable Care Act was the first law to set preventative coverage requirements 
for all health insurance plans across all markets. The law requires that private health plans cover a range of, preve of prevention services without cost sharing, specifically requiring health care plans to cover the full range of FDA approved contraceptive methods and sterilization procedures. The requirement was phased in beginning August 2012, however most health plans run in a calendar year. So for most women whose benefits would change, these began in January 2013. Almost immediately, this requirement became controversial. Through regulatory, through regulatory authority, the Obama administration created an exemption for houses of worship. However, this exemption did not extend to other employer types. Following the, su following the Supreme Court decision in the case of Burwell, Burwell versus Hobby Lobby, the Obama administration developed an accommodation for religiously affiliated nonprofits and closely held for-profit companies. In cases where employers are granted an accommodation, women workers and their dependents can still access contraceptive coverage, but, the insurer, but the, it's the insurer and not the employer who provides that access to these benefits. This was a way that the Obama administration was trying to um, balance the need for women to be able to access contraception with these, um, con with these conscious object conscientious objections. In May 2016, the Supreme Court, in the case of Zubik v. Burwell, sent seven cases brought by religious nonprofits profits objecting to the accommodation back to the, back to the respective federal courts of appeals. These cases were not resolved by the 2016 election, and the Trump administration decided not to defend these laws, lawsuits. In May 2017, President Trump issued an executive order directing federal agencies to address conscious-based conscious objections to the contraceptive requirement. It's a little bit of a tongue twister. Soon after, the soon after, the Departments of Health and Human Services, Labor, and Treasury issued interim final rules that dramatically expanded the policy on exemptions. The Trump administration also made it much easier to apply for and obtain the accommodation. Currently, there are multiple states suing the Trump administration over the rule, including California, Pennsylvania, and Maryland. As of July 2019, the Third Circuit Court helped upheld the nationwide injunction against the rule. However, it looks like the contraceptive coverage requirement could be on the path back to the Supreme Court. It is, precise, it is precisely because of these politics that it's important to have good information on the impact of policy decisions. When I first started my dissertation work, Dr. Miller said to me something to the effect of, every dissertation that doesn't have a conceptual framework at the beginning has a conceptual framework by the end. I took this as a very strong hint that I should start with a conceptual framework to guide my research and decided on the Anderson Behavioral Model of Health Service Use. The framework proposes that access to health services are influenced by both contextual characteristics, such as community characteristics or health policy decisions, as well as individual characteristics. The framework sets forth a way of explaining the interplay between individual characteristics and social and environmental factors and how taken together these can influence health behaviors and health outcomes. Applying this model to contraception, the ACA requirement changed the contextual characteristics by requiring private health insurance to cover contraception, thus attempting to influence a person's ability to access contraception by removing potential financial barriers. There are other potential, potential contextual characteristics that could influence contra contraceptive use, including the ability to get access to OBGYN services and other contraceptive counseling. There are also a number of individual characteristics that can influence contraceptive use and choice, including age, race, marital status, sexual activity, educational attainment, number of children, and cohabitation. These factors taken together can impact, impact health behaviors, including contraceptive choice and health outcomes, including unintended pregnancy. My research began with a literature review. Given that there was already state level requirements around contraception, there was a lot out there. I focused, I focused my literature review on two questions. 
Do insurance mandates or insurance coverage of contraception influence contraceptive choice? And does insurance coverage or low-cost access to contraception reduce the rate of unintended or mistimed pregnancies? In an attempt to identify as much of the available literature as possible, I identified three important concepts to use in this review when formulating my search strategy. Health reform concepts to identify any policy change that would impact the financing of contraception. Contraceptive concept, contraception concepts to identify studies of contraception use. And pregnancy desire to identify studies related to unwanted or mistimed pregnancy. Key words within each concept were joined by or, and each concept was joined by and. Multiple databases were queried to ensure some level of comprehensiveness. Inclusion criteria were decided before the search began using the, the PCOTS framework, which suggests six domains be defined for inclusion of a study in a review. These are population, intervention, comparator, outcome, time frame, and setting. The search process is outlined on the right, right side of the slide, and the initial search yielded 844 articles. After exact duplicates were, were removed using software, 770 articles were subjected to title review. During the title screening, 648 studies were eliminated. The most common reason for, the re for removal was the article focused on women outside of the US, or the pieces were clearly editorial and not a report of a rigorous study. Next, abstracts were screened and an additional 92 studies were eliminated. The most common reason for elimination of the study at this, at this juncture was the paper was testing a hypothesis unaligned with the hypothesis of the review. For example, it was looking at disparities in unintended pregnancy among racial and ethnic groups. 30 articles were read in full, with 10 meeting all the criteria for inclusion. Studies were included based on the level of analysis, testing a hypothesis unaligned with the hypothesis of the review, not including a compare and not including a comparison group. Of the 10 studies, and I'm sorry that the, the font there is really small, but of the 10 studies included in the literature review, three studies found an increased financial support for contraception reduces unintended pregnancies. Four studies found that decreasing cost sharing increases the use of long acting reversible contraception and contraceptive adherence and four studies that looked specifically at the ACA found a, bu a bunch of different outcomes. One found that, no that there was no change in contraceptive use patterns after the ACA. One found a reduction in cost sharing increased the use of LARC. One found that a reduction in cost sharing increased the use of any contraception. And the last found that the discontin discontinuation and non-adherence decreased after the Affordable Care Act. From this literature review, I concluded that, evidence, that there is some evidence that reducing cost barriers can increase contraceptive use, um, that, that the relationship between cost sharing for prescription contraception and unintended pregnancy deserves further exploration, and that given the additional time pass since the ACA passage, where people have been able to fully understand the implications of the law and the requirements, future study of the impact of the ACA on contraceptive use should be conducted. The literature review assisted in formulating my research questions, which are, did the Affordable Care Act contraceptive coverage requirement contribute to the increase in the use of all prescription birth control methods for women with private insurance? And did the ACA contraceptive coverage requirement impact the rate of unintended and mistimed pregnancies in women with private health insurance? In order to answer these questions, I identified the National Survey as fa of Family Growth as the best data source. The NSFG is the most comprehensive nationally avail national available data set that gathers information on family life, marriage, divorce, pregnancy, fertility, reproductive health, and contraceptive use. It's conducted by the CDC's National Center for Health Statistics, or NCHS, which I learned today. Judy used to work there. The timeline shows the major changes to the survey, which was launched in 1973 and designed to be a representative sample of civilian, non-institutionalized women ages 15 to 44. In 2002, 
NCHS added men as survey participants, and in 2005, it expanded the age for all participants to, 40, to 49. The NSFG surveys are compiled in cycles. The table, the table here shows the sample sizes of women in each of the four cycles that will be utilized in this study. While most of the variables of interest in the study are available through the NSFG public use data set, in order to complete the proposed sensitivity analysis, geographic contextual var variables will be required. These are only available through the restricted use data at the research data center. When I'm ready to put together my proposal to the um, RDC, when I'm ready, I will put together a proposal to the RDC um, with my committee. And I'm currently working with my committee to find the best way to access the restricted data. Reported contraceptive use has increased over the last decade, according to descriptive statistics from the NSFG. The first research question seeks to test whether this increase can be attributed to the ACA contraceptive coverage requirement. The dependent variable is current contraceptive method. The NSFG collects information on the use of any contraceptive method, including those that require a prescription and likely the use of an insurance benefit, like the pill or the IUD, and those that do not require a prescription, like the condom. This question is interested in the increased use of contraception that requires a prescription and insurance benefit use. According to research completed at the Guttmacher Institute, the rate of unintended pregnancy has been on the decline since 2008. The second research question seeks to test whether any of the decline in women with private insurance since the ACA contraceptive coverage requirement went into effect can be attributed to the federal policy change. The study group includes privately insured women between the ages of 18 and 44. Female Medicaid enrollees will serve as the control group. Family planning services are a mandatory benefit under Medicaid, but states have the discretion on identifying the specific services and supplies that are included in the state program. While the Medicaid population may not be the perfect counterfactual, the study seeks to, con the study seeks to control for some of the differences between the two groups. The independent, the independent variables include characteristics that could influence a person's perceived need or access to health services broadly and contraceptive services specifically. Both research questions will, util will utilize a difference in differences framework, which rests on the parallel trends assumption. Here, that assumption is that trends in both contraceptive use and, un and the unintended pregnancy rate would be similar in the treatment and control groups over time without changes to insurance coverage requirements initiated by the ACA. The variable of interest to the study is the difference in difference estimator highlighted by the red arrows um, on the screen, which is the treatment variable, or having private insurance, interacted with a post-intervention variable. So for those of you who, under, who know about the ACA, we know that a lot of things were happening at the same time. Um, and so we're going to have to do a number of sensitivity analysis um, to examine the effects of other, um, of other ACA changes um, and the uh, contraceptive coverage requirement. One of those is uh, the dependent coverage mandate. Um, which, require, which allows for uh, children up to 26 to stay on uh, their parents' health insurance. So for the dependent coverage mandate, one idea for my sensitivity analysis is to just eliminate all women under 26. Um, there's also uh, an, an, a need to examine the effects of the ACA requirement on states uh, with a prior contraceptive coverage requirement versus those uh, that had no contraceptive coverage requirement. Um, there's, and, and I will also perform falsification tests if necessary. Other sensitivity analysis that I'm discussing with uh, my committee at this time is looking at um, how changes to uh, Title X interacted with the um, ACA requirement. So I think that my study will have, um, hopefully, if there is an effect found, um, there is a, a need to think about um, what, 
when we think, when we look forward, um, thinking about um, how all of the politics around this are interacting with whether this is a good policy or not. So it's important to assess the most effective, accessing the most effective form of contraception is one important strategy in reducing the number of unintended and mistimed pregnancies. So allowing for that access and promoting that access is really important. Um, according to the Kaiser Family Foundation, employer-sponsored insurance is the way 57% of non-elderly Americans obtain insurance. Um, so this insurance benefit is really important to women of all ages. Um, and as HHS and the legal challenges continue, um, like I said earlier, we're going to need to have um, the best evidence that we can. So that includes my presentation. Thank you for listening, and I can take any questions. Maybe everybody really just wants the snacks in the back. <laughs> there are plenty left. Anyone have any questions? Okay. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Who was that? So, my mom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just have one question. Are you going to be able to analyze how these religious exemptions have affected you know, these, these unintended, like people who, the people who work for Hobby Lobby, for example. No, that, that, and that's really outside the scope of my study. Okay. Thank you. I don't answer your question, oh. sir. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, my question is, uh, there are still 12 medic States that have not uh, adopted Medicaid expansions, which mean um, some women with r relatively low incomes would, uh, in order to ob obtain uh, insurance coverage generally, but also access to contraceptive benefits, would have to go through private insurance coverage. Uh, have, are you contemplating any sort of adjustment for the Medicaid uh, expansion or not on your control population? That's a really good question, and it's something that I might want to think about. So, I wasn't, but now I am. <laughs> so, so, the, the other uh, question, and I don't know uh, how widespread this is, but there's been, uh, first of all, I'll put a plug in for the Healthcare Commission's uh, study on infant mortality. Uh, but during, during that, this, during that uh, work group, there was uh, evidence or discussion from advocates on the implications of moving uh, women uh, post-delivery back into the private insurance market where incomes were, uh, when incomes were quite low. Uh, and I think uh, that would be some other factor to consider. It's certainly not a direct uh, factor in use of contraceptives, but certainly a, po a population and a significant population because uh, during pregnancy, I believe you're eligible for Medicaid benefits up to 300 or thereabouts mm -hmm. after uh, postpartum, after the 60-day yeah. period. Uh, eligibility drops to, uh, you have to have incomes below 135 approximately. So there would be some additional uh, noise that uh, might need to be accounted for uh, in your research. I don't know, but just a suggestion. Great, thanks. Then I'll have to read that study. And, and who is it? What's the name of the agency again? I can't. I, I think it's some, some obscure organization. Uh, we'll see if we can find a copy for you. Uh, lady with the uh, baby in the back. Was was that pregnancy intended? <laughs> yes. Right. 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 So I had a very a different type of question. So looking at the framework that you laid out, what, if any, role is there for considering the partisan makeup of the various state governments? And if they've long held their partisan composition, or if there's a variable, like the change in governor. We've seen nine changes in governor in the past three years. So, I mean, I think that's a really, um, that's a really important factor. Um, I think, uh, I think, you know, the, the, these last two questions sort of interact with each other, the decision to expand Medicaid, and then the partisan makeup are sort of 
you know, are very related. Um, so I think I could think about, rather than thinking about partisan makeup, thinking about that expansion question, I think that might cover a little bit of what, of what you're getting at here. Um, you mentioned in the model that, that you had uh, the significance, thank you, um, the significance of contextual factors, so certainly access uh, to contraception through the ACA, but also individual um, behavioral uh -huh. kinds of questions. And I'm wondering how, I, I know that you're not studying the individual behavioral things, but I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how that, uh, how that, um, might shape what you would expect with regard to findings um, about about expansion of the ACA. So uh, you know, there's a there's a couple of things in, uh, in this question um, that I think are important to consider. So a, a woman's choice of what type of contraceptive to use is not just based on whether she could pay for it or not. There's a lot of you know um, people women make choices based on what sounds silly, but what their friends and, and people around them are using, what they know about, um, who they trust, how, how much trust they have in, you know, the, the medical system, how much access they have to actually getting to a clinic. So, you know, for something like the pill where you have to go every year and have a pap smear and all of that, you know, that will all impact your adherence to, um, to your contraceptive regimen. And I think what I am... Um, trying to do and starting to explore now, and especially after having conversations with my committee and my defense, is how can I use the data in the NSFG to um, account for as many of those access factors and, and behavioral factors as I can um, through the, through the uh, statistical analysis. So I will be trying to account for some of them, um, but there's always going to be some things oh, that, yeah. Does that an kind of answer your question? Yeah, kind of, <laughs> since you're saying kind of, I'm going to say kind of too, because now this is really a stretch for me. But since, um, I, I would imagine that there are, since you mentioned that people learn, and it doesn't sound silly, people learn yeah. about contraception from yeah. their friends and neighbors. Right. Um, so you could imagine that there, and I'm completely imagining, that there are some patterned differences yeah. um, that m might map onto, again, yeah. either state partisanship or state and. Um, state Medicaid expansion, yep. and so I'm not asking you to draw any conclusions at all, but is there any way of thinking about that? Do you know what I mean? The intersection between yeah. the expansion of Medicaid and availability of insurance and individual behaviors, and so that's yeah. as vague as it sounds. Yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to yeah, think about that, I just think, yeah. but I think that's a great idea to try to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, again, you're, you're looking at the expansion of yeah. individual behavior. Yeah. You know, I would have invited all of you if I thought you were going to ask questions. So I'm just a simple and humble engineer, but based on your... You're definitely not humble. <laughs> but I would have assumed that unattended pregnancies are uh, would skew towards younger females. And so when you said that you would exclude those that are 26 and younger, I was wondering if you could expand a little more. I understand the thought process, but I, I don't know what you're excluding based on that as well. Right? No, I mean, I think that's a really good point. The exclusion for those women under 26 was it would only be in my sensitivity analysis. So my main analysis would include them, but I would want to see if those women under 26 are increasing their access to contraception because they may be remaining on their parents' health insurance. And so that might be the intervention that is actually contributing to their increased access. And so the idea with that exclusion is to see if the um, outcome will change if you exclude them so that you um, can kind of account for a little bit of that interaction between the, the two different interventions. That answer is acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> Have to know that's your husband. Yeah, well, that's, thanks, honey. He's my husband for now. <laughs> I don't work for you anymore. You don't. One question. That's so, it. Well, 
I wanted to use the allotted hour for meaningful. Uh, so I may have missed it, but how are you defining unintended? So an unintended or a mistimed pregnancy is um, defined as an, an unwanted pregnancy, a, a pregnant, at the time of conception, the woman was not actively trying to get pregnant or it's mistimed because while well, she may want to get pregnant at some point in the future, she wasn't ready to get pregnant now. And it's self-reported through the NSFG. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I would, uh, yeah, I think that's a, uh, it seems to me based on my limited uh, knowledge in this area, uh, appropriate because uh, pregnancy spacing mm -hmm. is a really important consideration. And uh, if it's just self-reported, unintended, uh, it seems like you would capture most, but if you used a pregnancy spacing, mm -hmm. if that's available yeah. on your data, yeah. you could actually somehow use that. I'm not saying it is as determinative as a, as a stated unintended pregnancy, but there are <coughs> significant risk factors with uh, tightly placed uh, children that might be uh, important to understand as well. Yeah. Well, I want to thank um, the School of Public Policy. I shouldn't say the department, because you are a, we are a school now. Um, and especially thank Dr. Chernobyl's family again. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.